Good morning, Grandchildren Church. We have a prayer. Open our eyes and do a prayer for us. Good morning, everybody. We're going to start with prayer today. Father God, we thank you that you are a God who is with us in times of difficulty. You are a God who's with us in times of, of pain and in times of hurt. But we pray that as we read different stories today, as we sing different songs today, as we open your word today, that you would teach us and show us your heart for us. We thank you that you are a God who does have a heart of great affection and care for us. So as we go to these things, Lord, teach us. Lord, show us something new about yourself today. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Well, now we are going to go to Christy as she leads us in worship, and we look forward to hearing how she's going to lead us. As our call to worship this week, I want to share some words with you from Psalm chapter 48, verses 9 and 10. Oh God, we meditate on your unfailing love as we worship in your temple. As your name deserves, O oh God, you will be praised to the ends of the earth. Your strong right hand is filled with victory.
Okay guys, we're going to start with the surprise box this morning. I'm really excited because Sam's joining me with us today. Come on, Sammy, bring the surprise box and let's see what's inside here. Is it a big surprise or a scary surprise? Ah! Okay. Well, in our surprise box today, yeah. what we have is... A giraffe! Yeah. What kind of giraffe is it? Is it a real giraffe or a fake giraffe? Big giraffe. Big giraffe? Yeah. That's right. A couple years ago, Donnie was given this giraffe uh, when it was serving on a mission trip uh, to help some people build some schools and help out with the church. What is cool about this reminder is that it reminds me of, of a time when we helped out some kids. And one of the cool things that they said to us was, we know that God loves us because you guys are here. We know that God takes care of us because you guys are here and you're looking after us. And so what that reminds me of is a story that we're going to read this morning uh, from a book that reminds us of how God is with us. And because he's here, because he's with us, we know that God loves us and takes care of us. Uh, so we're going to read this story called The Paralyzed Man. Oh, we're going to switch sides. There you go. Ready? Hold up the lefty. And this shows us about how God cares about us. Okay? Okay. This is called A Paralyzed Man. Jesus was becoming quite well known because of his teaching and healing ministry. More and more people flocked to him, but Jesus often found a quiet place away from the crowds. There he prayed to his father for strength. The Jewish religious leaders called scribes and Pharisees also followed Jesus, but they had no faith in him. They only wanted to find fault with him because they were jealous. One day Jesus was teaching a house full of people. Suddenly they heard noises above them. Somebody was making a hole in the roof. More and more pieces of the roof came off, then a large object slowly came down. It was a paralyzed man on a mat. Four men were lowering him to Jesus. Jesus rejoiced to see their faith in him. He was pleased that the men would get so much trouble just to help their friend out. Everyone watched Jesus eagerly. Would he perform a miracle? Though Jesus had never seen this man before, he knew there was something the man needed even more than bodily healing. Jesus said, Son, rejoice, for your sins are forgiven. The scribes and Pharisees were outraged at Jesus' words. How dare he forgive this man, they thought. God is the only one who can forgive sin. Who does he think he is? Jesus knew what the scribes and Pharisees were thinking. He asked them, Is it harder to forgive sins than it is to cure diseases? I will show you that I do have the power to forgive sins. Then Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Get up, he said. Take up your mat and go home. And immediately the man rose and rolled up his mat. He started walking home, joyfully praising God. The man's four friends and those who had seen this miracle also praised God. And they were amazed at his power. What an amazing story that is about the paralyzed man that shows us that God cares about us because Jesus was here and that Jesus is here. And he looks after our needs and he takes care of the different things that we need help with in life. And look at the courage of his friends who would do anything possible to get their friend to Jesus. That's a really good, important and reminder for each of us today. So if you're one of our older kids and you want to understand a bit more of the story, we have a few verses here for you guys to check out. And kids, if you want to ask your parents about a few of these questions, they can also help you to understand more of this story too. And the questions say, what was wrong with the man? Who brought the man to Jesus and how did they do it? And what did Jesus do for him? And so an amazing thing that we've seen in the surprise box today of the reminder of that and in our story today, Daddy. that because God is with us, we see that he cares about us. And you can trust somebody who shows up and does what he can to help you. So I'm going to um, uh, look at the verse that we have as a memory verse today uh, that talks about trust. It says, this is from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, a memory verse that everybody should have memorized. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, 
and he will make your paths straight. So that's your memory verse for this week. You can trust somebody who cares about you. You can trust somebody who shows up in your life. And God certainly does all of those. And we've seen that in the life of Jesus too. Oh, Miss Chrissy, play a song for us. Good morning, Grandstone Church. We're going to keep reading this weekend in Psalm chapter 10. And we cut it in half because we need to stop and see really what's being said here in this psalm that's a bit longer than your normal psalm. You know, last week we started by, by looking at this idea that kids ask all kinds of questions all the time. Uh, they want to know how everything works. They want to know why everything is the way that it is. They want to know why the sky looks the way that it does. 
they have tons of questions at all times and all places. You know, I was thinking about it during the course of the week, not just about how our own kids have questions, but adults have all kinds of questions too. It's not just the little kids, it's us too. And I thought about something that I read a few years ago, and I talked about the way that we as adults ask questions. We want to know certain things about God. We don't know why He does things a certain way. We want to know why God operates in a certain way. And one author pointed out, when we ask the question, why does God operate like this? Very often what most of us are asking is, why does God operate like this with me? Why does God operate in this manner towards me? And really what we're asking is, when we ask questions about God and the way that he works, we're very often asking questions about why he operates ways that he does towards us. It's a personal question. Because there's so many things that happen in life along the way that are unexpected, that are painful, that, are, that just don't make any sense at all. And so many times we want to know why God is doing these things uh, why is God operating in certain ways towards us in the way that he does? And that's part of this whole conversation. Because we do doubt, because we want to know what the plan is sometimes, and very often we're not sure what that is. And so the Psalms come, come to us. The Psalms come to us as a voice. The Psalms come to us as a helper to help us to give expression to these questions. And so why is a question? It's not just for kids, it's for the big kids too. And if I have the human heart right, I think we don't just ask why when we're nine months old, we ask why when we're 90 years old as well too. All the way through life, we ask the question, why? Why do things happen the way that they do? So. This week we're going to be reading the second half of Psalm 10, and this is what it says. It says, But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked man. Call the evildoer to account for his wickedness that would not otherwise be found out. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his hand. You, Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed so that the mere earthly mortals will never again strike terror. Now it's interesting as we look at this psalm, one of the things we're reminded of is that there is not an immediate answer to the list of questions the psalm writer comes up with. The first thing that he starts with is wanting to know why God is so far off. Where are you, God? What's, what's the plan? What are you doing here in my life? And then he turns to the rest of the world after he looks at his own life. And he says, and, and besides, look at all these people over here. Look at all these guys over here who are plotting all kinds of things, doing all kinds of things. Not only do they plot things in their actions, but also in the words, the, thing these, the things these guys say are so terrible and inflammatory. The things that they say to all these other people, they're always plotting ruin towards other people. They're always plotting all this drama and toxicity in their relationships. There's all this drama, all these terrible things going on with people. And not only on top of that, but with their words, they reject you to the point of floating this rejection that they have of you, God. So what are you doing about it? What are you doing about what's going on in my life and what's going on all around me? This big mess of stuff that we see all around us. And in spite of all the pain that the writer's experiencing, in spite of all the pain that he sees all around him, the place where he lands is in committing himself even more so to who God is and committing himself to God and his relationship to him. This isn't a light commitment. It's an expression here that literally means 
to abandon himself. That's what's meant here when he says he commits to him. And why does he do this? Why does, why does this writer commit himself after he has just come out of this place of expressing anxiety, of expressing doubt, of expressing just, he's completely at a loss for words to describe the world around him. How does he, why does he express faith here? And he expresses faith because we see here in verse 14. He says, But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. In the ESV version it says, But you do see. But you do see everything that's going on all around you. You do see everything that's happening in my life. You do know where we live. You do know our address. You do know our names. You do know our situation. You do know the cries of my heart. And you do see all the things that we're doing down here. You do see the guy that's going around um, ruining other people's lives with his actions and with his words. You do see all the chaos that's down here. And you take them in hand. Uh, so you hold them close. You know them with a great deal of familiarity. Uh, one that's far greater than we have any sense of. And that's why he responds with faith. That's why he responds, abandoning all of himself uh, to God with faith. Because God does see everything that's going on right now. And so he commits himself to God. You know, one of the things that we talk about when somebody gets married or when somebody gets baptized, we take this moment that's a big commitment. And it's kind of funny because uh, when you're at a wedding, we say, now all these witnesses are here and, you know, they'll check up on you. They'll see how your commitment in your marriage is going. Or when someone gets baptized, they'll say, you know, all these people at the church are here. And, you know, they're going to support you relationally. They're going to see how things are going. All these things are big time commitments in our life. And so I want to check in right now and just ask you, you know, how's your commitment to God going? How's that relationship going? I mean, you might have a voice that's in the same lane as the psalmist where you're just completely disoriented because the way things are in your own life and the way things are like in the world. But do you, are your most deepest level of your heart understand that God is a God who sees and takes in hand everything that's going on around you and as you do that do you commit yourself to him do you commit yourself greater today than you did yesterday to God do you commit yourself more to him this year than you did last year do you um, abandon yourself to him in a greater sense than you did uh, last week, last year, and all these places in our lives? Are you seeing his hand uh, at work in your life? And even if you're not seeing it, do you still place your trust in him? Because God has shown himself, not just throughout history, but even in your own life, that he is worthy of our trust, that he is worthy of, of our faith as the God of our lives, as scripture calls him. And, the, and he goes on to say something very interesting. In verse 15, he says, Break the arm of the wicked man. Call the evildoer to account for his wickedness that would not otherwise be found out. Um, that sounds really bad, break the arm of the wicked man. That sounds like something from uh, mixed martial arts or something. <laughs> but um, it's an expression of breaking the power of somebody who's an oppressor towards other people. Uh, it's a call for fairness. It's a call for justice. We want God to act justly in the world because we always see things that we wish would come to light. And so we ask for a day of justice to be done, not just in small things, but in big things that we see all around us in the world. And so he's asking that God would work amongst not just in our, 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 our small situations that we have today, but in the nations all around the world, and then we ask him to act in justice. You know, when we consider the world that we live in, the small world that's our own world, the big world that's our planet, 
what's amazing is that the, the psalm writer goes and he starts with the ground that he's standing on. Then he looks around to the world around him. Okay, we're going bigger. Then he looks out at the, the entire world, the entire universe. Okay, that's a lot bigger. And he says, now we have to think about the God who is the maker of all of this. To consider our maker. This maker who's more beautiful, more complex. And when you're standing next to the maker of an immeasurable universe, okay, the universe as big as it is, it's his footstool. Would you put yourself next to him and his size and his magnitude? We, in fact, are very, very small. And in fact, he uses the word puny uh, to describe how small we are. And it's so fascinating because he starts in accusation. He starts in a place where he's lost. And he moves in this circle where he begins to see that, no, in fact, God does see everything that's going on in this world. And he holds them all in hand. And then he moves to this place of acknowledging God's activity, of acknowledging God's place where he's the king in all of his life. And he ends in a place of humility of seeing himself as small. What? <laughs> that's, the, that's this complete cycle that we often see in the Psalms where we start angry and we end humbly because we really do start to grasp who God is. And the more you grasp who God is, the bigger he is and the smaller that we are. You know, it's something that we think of even today. We, we see all this stuff going on around us in the world today. And we just, we cry out for justice. We cry out for God to see the things that are hidden to be brought to the light. And though it might not be today, though we might not get the answers that we want today, there is a day of future justice that God has promised for all acts of injustice that have been committed upon the earth. And even though you don't get your answer today, what you do get is God's personal presence with you today as you struggle. And you may need immediately to see, uh, you, you might not see everything that you want, but what we do have is the promise of God being right there beside you as you struggle with whatever it is that's causing you difficulty and pain today. And that points forward too. It points forward to something that's this, that's this memorable passage for us from 2 Corinthians where Paul was reminded of this, of this. He said, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about the weaknesses, about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Think about how those two things with that song and with this passage here in 2 Corinthians, which many of us are very familiar, ties together. So my challenge for you this week is this. In light of what we've read this morning, in light of what we've been thinking about, when something bad, when something difficult, when something hard, when something painful comes into your life, I want you to stop. I want you to pause and count it down. Three, two, one. Okay. Instead of reacting, instead of coming to certain conclusions, certain assumptions, I want you to stop and be open to what's going on in your life, to what God has let through the gate in your life, to think of it as an opportunity to lean on God's strength and grace. Before we react, before the volcano of our reaction comes to the surface, stop, three, two, one, count it down, and think about how this could be an opportunity to lean on God's strength, of God's grace, of God's care for you. That's where the psalmist ended. 
He said, you do see what's going on in, in my life. Not only do you see, but you do hear everything that's going on in my life. You, you do know because you walked with us. Jesus was God with us. You, you do care. You do hear. You are with us when we go through this. And we know that God loves us because he's there, because he shows up. And that's the deception that's there, is that when we go through pain, we think, that like, that must mean that God's absent when I'm here in this pain. But actually, God's word tells us, tells us that that's the farthest thing from the truth. When God is in, when we are in pain, when we are in difficulty, God's never closer than he is in that moment. And that's something that we have to learn time and time again, because we automatically think that, that pain is the absence of God and his presence in our life. Well, the psalm tells us that's, that's, that's not true. And Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians that, that that's not true. Be reminded of again, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When weakness comes, so does strength, because God is with you. You know what? You guys are loved. You are loved because you are never left alone on the worst day of your life. In fact, God promises his closeness to us far more than we ask, far more than we understand or imagine in that moment. Let's pray to this God together. Father God, we thank you that you are a God who is a God who sees you are a God who hears. You are a God who knows. And you are a God who is close. You are a God who helps. And we may not get the answers that we're looking for. We may not get the answers that we demand. But the other thing that's true, God, is that when we really start to grasp who you are and who we are, that humbles us. That helps us to sort out who's God and who's not in our own lives. And Lord, for those who are hearing this or who are watching this, who are in pain, who are in difficulty, who are crying out for justice, Lord, please remind us that you meet both of those very deep felt needs that we have. Lord, that you are close and that you have a day of justice that is coming for everything that we think remains unseen here too as well. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness to us. And thank you that we can, whenever we reach to you, that you are close and that you're here to help us along the way in life. Thank you, Lord. We ask this again and say thank you in Jesus' name. I wanted to thank uh, each of you for joining us today. Thanks for, for being here to worship with us, to open God's word with us. And if there's anything uh, that we can uh, be here for you in any way, whether it's just chatting on the phone or whether it's praying with you, uh, please feel free to use our phone number here. Use, um, use our email. Use our email account. Prayer at Grindstone Church. If there's any way we can pray for you and help you, we certainly want to be there for you with us. So, Grindstone, I hope you guys have a great week and know as you walk through it that God is with you and that when pain comes, when weakness comes, that could be an opportunity to lean on the strength and the grace of God.